Did you know that orcs keep growing bigger and stronger the older they get? As long as they don't get crumped, that is. It's October the 98th, and I'm going to build the biggest, baddest orc you have ever seen. First things first, if you want a big orc, you're going to need a big head. I start by pointing at this drawing and making a circular motion to establish what's coming next. I use some aluminum foil, steel wire, and hot glue to make a ball that I can then stab with a pencil. With the noggin armature complete, I mix up some ancient green stuff that is full of dried bits, but still good enough for a base layer. Green stuff tends to cure slightly flexible, and I want a very thick and solid cranium, so I add some milliput into the mix to make the now famous grilliput stuff. I use gloves because it gets all icky. I apply the putty to the skull until I get a green ski mask looking thing. Then I add in the nose details, smooth it out with some tools that I think are for sculpting. Water helps when smoothing. I have developed this advanced tusk making system. As the putty is curing, you repeatedly stretch and tear and stack it. Eventually you can work this cylindrical blob into a cone, all the while maintaining the cool ridge details down the sides of the tooth. Check out this broken tusk. It has a nice level of rough interior detail and a kind of outer layer that mimics the enamel lamination of teeth. Once the skull is cured, it's very easy to shape it using normal tools like a nail file and hobby knife. Boink! Hey, a wise guy. Next is the ocular bestowment consisting of some soap pump bearings, which are either glass or shiny plastic. Now that they can see, it's time to let them frown and sniff as well. A new batch of putty to build up more facial structure. I spent way, way too long on the nose here. I even had to resort to looking at an official model to check out the profile. With its big nose in place, it was time this granny also got some big teeth. I had a selection that I had made each time there was leftover putty. After some dental whittling and buffing to create the perfect balance between battle damage, possibly bizarre eating habits, and hygienist approved polish, I had a pretty good looking set ready to go. Using screws to get the strongest and most realistic attachment, I positioned the main upper teeth. Aw, look at this cute little fungus beaver. Okay, let's get the rest of the upper chompers on and then it's one final trip to the tooth barber for a shave. More sculpting? Okay, learn with me. We need to add a stiff upper lip. Then this gets finished off with some highly advanced vertical lines, which will serve as detail. Now for another layer of mean brow. Press the like button. After squishing that flat, I sort of wiggled the tool around to make a cool looking eye socket. That's enough head for now. Look at these bits. Patreon credits. It's torso time, and not just any torso. This is a Mega Mech Suit torso. I have this Mega Blocks piece which might make a good upper collar. Test fit? Nice. Then I add in these interesting pieces which hold in the dust bag in a hand vacuum cleaner. Everything is roughed up with a file and attached with super glue. Compared to my normal haphazard style, I feel like I'm cut, transform, glue, with all this careful placement and thin CA glue usage. I think this is my first time using Super Glue Accelerator. The spraying version is just an insane and dumb AoE attack, so I use the straw to bloop out a little dollop instead. The shoulders get extended with these wood looking mega blocks. Then I attach this really cool round opening bit, which is also from a vacuum. More bulking out in the form of die cast transformer bits and this roll cage bar and maybe something from Playmobil to finish off the framework of the front. Time to stack more detail on the front with some symmetrical chunks of transformer and this green robo lizard thigh piece. Then onto the power plant reactor backpack zone. I cut up this car toy fragment and some more transformer parts and then start to bulk it out. Adding some vents around the main reactor and then using a lid stack and this plastic champagne cork for the perfect power core. The nice detail inside these salsa lids will lend itself well to arm sockets. This slightly smaller ring fits in and can act as articulation of the shoulder, even though it'll be glued in place. Continuing the back with a neat Mega Bloks piece, and then this little discovery that fit perfectly in place, the area surrounding the reactor gets bulked out with more symmetrical or nearly symmetrical toy parts. Even more enhancements, including this off-centered mini vent, generic looking engine component, and these curved pipes from a Simpsons toy. Time to get a leg up. Starting off the Asimov's foot foundation with some Mega Bloks rectangles. Around these I will arrange an assortment of sloped bricks, VCR buttons, and cassette deck buttons. I use these very unique wide blocks as the toe and ankle. Then with these interesting buttons I set up the basis for some large toe claws. 
This sloped plastic piece is cut from a VHS loading tray and has a nice amount of surface detail, giving it the appearance of heavy cast metal. The rest of the space is filled in with a variety of the previously mentioned blocks and buttons. One of the considerations was to make the foot seem large and clunky, but not perfectly square, so the side supporting pieces slightly bow out away from the foot. I always cut away the studs from the blocks and file or sand in a bit of damage and weathering. Sometimes it's wise to weather on the go. Certain elements can become inaccessible as the build progresses. After taking inventory of a few promising leg pieces, I start to test out the ankle joint. This plastic jar is a super glue multi-pack and the ball is a Guinness ball. With a mega block spacer, the jar is attached to an RC car wheel. I don't know what this clear piece is, but I need a shin, so let's hack it up and stick it on. A few of these bigger Megablox panels fit nicely to form the sides of the shin. For the calf section, I got this pair of old carbon monoxide detectors, and the shell is a cool shape and a really awesome plastic. Not only does it have a cool surface detail, it's somewhat soft and it takes sawing and weathering like a charm. The knee joint needs some width, so after adding this cassette deck reel, you know I called upon the power of the bit and a gear, but I mean, who cares about that? It's, it's all about the bit. For the hip, I had these cool metal and plastic char lids, which I hole punched a bunch to add some rivets. This hole punch is the best. Some mega blocks to make a skinny thigh, then this epically cool piece of whiteout roller to transition from hip to thigh. Coincidentally, these curved mega blocks fit the curve of the knee joint wheel, so I was able to add them in to give it a tasteful thickness. I think this looks a lot more like a mechanical knee joint now. And those pieces get lined up with these mini rounded bits attached to this panel. More building blocks to bulk out the thigh, including this classic H-shaped toy and this fuel tank looking piece. Then we got some kind of bulldozer blade. Again, this kind of element pushes the silhouette away from a distinctly Lego or Mega Bloks based build. A small round lid to cap off whatever this thigh extension is. And then the additional component for the knee mechanism. I match up a few of the details on the calf by drilling and slicing away at the other side and the adjoining panel. After some test posing, I set out the width of the hips on this piece and then add some duct tape to make a tighter fit for posability. This is a case where using a building toy comes in handy as everything fits together and works nicely. I perch an old coffee lid on top as a waist joint and then get to work on the mechanical butt. I got these awesome looking airplane parts from my cousin, which will work great as rear leg control arms or pistons. I space them out with a pen and use a few mega blocks to set up the lower placement. Once those were in place, I start to add in various gears. I wanted to have some stuck in behind the scenes, but also as a more predominant feature. For those obvious gears, I stacked a few and loaded them into this old razor housing a Simpsons car roll cage, and an unidentified toy bit to finish off the derriere de mécanique. These lids with the wide grip grooves, packed with clunky gears, are the foundation of the front hip area. I fill these cable protectors with wire so that they can more easily pose them, a sliced pen and contact lens solution nozzle for some abductor pistons. Finally, the mecha crotch is made up of what I think is a Mega Bloks piece and some transformer fenders. Let's fatten up those hammies with half a shovel bucket and a little angled block. These metal pants are indecently hoisted, displaying far too much ankle. I better hide that behind what is ostensibly a hydraulic component. A soap pump lid capped off with a wooden disc will fit the bill. I wanted more mechanisms along the side of the ankles. This is a cool piece made with a detergent cap and a super glue tube cap. One lid provides the cool outer dimension detail and the other has this nifty internal six-sided pattern. The other side gets gears. Symmetry be darned. The outer toe claws are, I think, bionicle armor? Uh, I'm sorry, Lego. Back to the noggin. The bottom teeth get mounted into a poseable housing made from wire. I opted for the second from outer tusks to be the longest as opposed to the outer tusks. I think this gives a more intimidating profile. Using more foil, I set up the foundation for the most impressive jaws or size testimonial yet. With the jaw shape redemption in place, I'm getting a much better idea of the final scale. The cranium needs bulk. I asked foil for some help, and they said, okay. Since foil and hot glue are kind of smooth, I stipple on some modeling paste to give the putty something to stick to. Once that dries, it's like a little spiky rock. I build up the epic Chad jaw using this sausage of green stuff and milliput. 
Again, that green stuff is too flexible and we want a rock solid jaw. Some expert shaping using professional tools and it's looking good. I mounted the head to a lid and then drilled out some spaces to add cyborg components. This is a bit from a car model to give that Cloud City headphone guy look. Then a few tension springs for cabling and this little metal panel. Back to the torso. Whoopsie, the head doesn't really fit with this Omega Flex jawline. A uh, quick cut and paste should clear that up. This is my friend, Mr. Block. Him and his pals want to contribute to strong shoulder sockets. Who am I to say no? Forge World has really been sleeping on these next level wooden maneuvers. Once that base is attached, play some shoulder Jenga and save that piece for later. Remember those big old legs? Time to add a hula capable waist attachment and, oh dang it. All right, this waist socket is a lot bigger than I thought it would be, so a slight adjustment is required. The front part is attached to the waist, which was either a Bluetooth speaker or a vaporizer or something. Once that's nicely secured with popsicle stick reinforcements, position and reattach the back power source. More stick reinforcement, and then it's all about the bulk. Matching pieces from a knockoff Nerf gun. It's Nerf for nothing. More of the wooden looking mega blocks and some spray bottle pieces. Next, I wanted to bulk out more of the technological details surrounding the reactor. I used green lizard thighs and transformer bits to establish a thicker angled structure on each side of the back, splitting this projectile launcher mega blocks piece to get an approximately symmetrical set of semi cylinders. Once those were in place, it was time to just go ham with the detailing. I start to pile on the offcuts along with more straight up mega block chunks. I also start to add in various tubes that will be the foundation of exhaust stacks. Here is part of a car's car and a Mega Bloks cannon mount. This has to be a top 5 detail piece for orcs. I used one in my Gargant way back when. More detailed round things to add the appearance of protruding machinery. Orc technology isn't very coherent. In fact, wow, I almost forgot the lore. <laughs> I've got these loose bolts here, so in you go. Okay, I will now maim some Hasbro knockoff Mega Bloks to frame out the upper surface and also to get these great looking vents into the side of the pack. This little transformer piece to cap out whatever this part of the engine is, and then some big tubes because that's just fitting for the setting. A bit of wire inside helps with posability. It is no secret that I prefer to make orc armored forms from various mega blocks. No exception here as I place them in to fill out some of the larger gaps. Tubes time. These are thickly insulated garden wire ties. They work so well as pipes and or heavy cables. I play around with a few configurations and at the same time begin to weave in more smokestacks. Ooh, watch me add rivets to this little piece of brass using this leather hole punch. Cutting down a pen lid and then giving it a smaller inner dimension with a super glue lid. That is a fine looking exhaust pipe. This interesting looking part was featured in one of my haul videos. After it was fully disassembled, I placed it around to keep the visual interest of this greeble zone high. Another exhaust pipe and this little disc. Not wanting to neglect the sides, I cut up this highlighter lid to fill in some of the unsightly gaps. And now we get to the best part, kit bashing. Patreon. I use these actual car kit pieces to add some nice angled peaks to the smokestacks, as well as this great engine detail under the reactor. One more vent can't hurt right here, and one little kit bit won't hurt here either. Head, torso, legs, boo! This thing needs more daca. Daca, daca. daca. Behold the bits. Got some gun barrels and other stuff, but mostly gun barrels. For the main and big boom cannon, I have the insert from an olive oil bottle. This will go into the trash. This giant red trash can. The next barrel, maybe kind of battle cannon sized, comes from an espresso machine. Hey, shout out to my friend's dad who fixed my bike 25 years ago and gave me this sheared off bearing after replacing it. Why did I hang on to it? For this very moment. After imagining how this thing will attach to the arm, I get to work assembling the frame. Black plastic components are from printers and VCRs, and the orange components are from decommissioned Nerf guns. A bit of angle block bracing, and the first barrel goes in. I think these combined orc weapons occur organically. One big cannon is great, but has a lot of room around it to add other big cannons, and between those, some big shootas. So I do that, with a bit of popsicle stick and mega block spacers in between. This is going to have a metal fist type glove handle because I don't want to sculpt a hand. I prune down this printer component and stick a dangerous Kinder Surprise boat hull on the front. Cannons are cool, but how about plasma? 
This staple stack will be the coils, and I frame it out with interesting nerf components. I've always thought the top of a lighter looks like the Doom plasma gun, so it's fitting to use it here. Squish that down over this button and attach to the coils. Some unknown but neat plastic bit to finish the front, and then more nerf bits for the siding and barrel. If you know something about cars, you might recognize this, but I don't, so to me it's just three cool cylinder details. The plasma cannon will attach to the side here, so I need to lay in the detail that will sit above and behind it. First, some big shooter barrels made from various plastic tubes. This black pen cap provides the outer dimension, and the end is capped off with this white plastic washer. I really prefer the look of a heavy, thick-walled shooter instead of just like a random pipe that has paper-thin walls. I use a mix of toy bits and small plastic elements from electronics to bulk out the rest of the side. This clear piece is very nicely detailed, and it comes from an old digital camera. A bit of cabling here made from plain old wire. It has less detail than something like guitar string, but it's tucked in behind, so it should stand up. Hmm, okay, one steel wire for good measure. Time to build up the other side. A block for spacing, and this chunk of plastic, probably from a tape deck. A trimmed down toy missile launcher on the bottom, and here's a nice shooter made with a metal rod and some plastic toy. I also had these awesome ammo belts, which would fit in here and other places, later. DACA uses a lot of ammo. A bit of a greeble insert, and then the plasma cannon is attached. While I'm stuck on energy weapons, let's do a bit of a turbo laser for the other side. These soap pump components and fake Lego Technic pieces actually look better than the Forge World stuff. I forget where exactly these metal tubes are from, some electronic probably. Anyway, the scale and stepped circumferences make for a very nice shooter barrel. After some spacer and filler bits are added, the turbo laser gets attached at a perfectly orky angle. Time for some beefcake muscularity. I make a professional grade armature from popsicle sticks. Yes, this is literally an armature. After fiddling with the angles, I lock it all in with the pistolet and air hose combo before wrapping it in steel wire. Here is a lesson in orc myology. Much like packages sent by Red Green, all muscle fibers are just bundles of brown wrapping paper bound by duct tape. Yeah, and the subdermal layers are foil and hot glue. Trust me, this is real lore. Alright, once this massive meat log is cooled down, I layer on green stuff to build in the detail. I won't pretend that I am an expert, or that this putty isn't expired, but here's how I do it. Lay down some green snakes approximately mimicking the underlying musculature, and then using what is presumably a sculpting tool, smooth it down and work in some grooves and lines. If the green stuff is kind of lumpy, but has still been a good boy, you can pet it aggressively as long as you use water. And it's squeaky! If you don't trust your own green stuff work, you can cheat and put down a sneaky layer of streaky modeling paste. As long as the streaks are uninterrupted and all go in one direction, we can pass this off as muscle striations. In the world of grimdark melee weapons, nothing makes more sense than an axe with a chainsaw blade and nothing makes less sense than an orc that hasn't looted something. Join me as we loot this very real authentic tank hull to make a giant axe blade. Instead of the tank treads, it will be a toothy chain blade. Awesome, right? Using a large toy with a vaguely handle-like shape, I trim it down to handle size. I prepare this nifty chunk chain necklace and then get to work spacing out the hull halves. Mega blocks work well here since they work well everywhere. Cut in some channels for chain slidage. I fill up the doorway with plastic gears so that we can look in and get the effect of a look through fireplace, but it's on a giant orc chainsaw axe, in space, in the future, and it's not a fireplace. After a few non-gear components get added to round it out, the casing is welded shut with glue. I stack several tubes in this cool castle hex nut to form the handle. A cool detailed block provides a support piece. I test and then glue on the chain but I'm really chomping at the bit to sink my teeth into the spiky uh, blade, the, like the blade pointy things that go on the chain. VCR buttons sawn at various angles to make two variations alternated along the chain. If those aren't some convincingly damaging teeth, I don't know what is. Meaty Arm Armature 2 Judge Meat Day, the sequel. Now with finger indicators. Oh, dang it, I said I didn't want to. But okay, I use some foil tubes to make the fingers along with hot glue, then the same technique of squeezing the final value out of 20 year old green stuff. Many fibers laid and smushed with tools, and some tiny pats for you. 
with some newer, more pliable green stuff, I start to envelop and detail the hand. Most people will chastise you for leaving prints on your putty, but this guy is so big that my thumbprint is unironically scale appropriate detail. With a pointy metal stick, I work out this gnarly orc nail claw thing. Now the palm needs palm meat. I use my very tough and masculine hands as reference. Once the finger sausages are all squished on, I go about detailing the knuckle wrinkles and nails in the same way. Final man hand check. Looking good. You know, for all my desire to avoid this, the sculpting is a lot of fun. Leave a comment if I should start sculpting in every single build from now on. Huh, gotcha. I immediately cheat with the streaky model paste technique. Everything is starting to look big and epic and super colorful. It's also full of gaps. Gaps that must be filled. And so, back by popular demand, it's the pre-spackle priming. I prime it zenithally with black and white, and then crackle out the spackle. As well as targeting minor gaps and cracks, this is the best time to fully fill in the exposed mega blocks to hide their origins forever. I'm also looking for places where an implied panel needs to be joined or have an edge tidied up. After smushing the spackle into place with the sculpting tool, I will sometimes come in with a damp brush to knock down the gnarly surface. Once that spackle is dry, it's time to bring it in line with the original surface. This can be accomplished with satisfying shaving, acceptable nail filing, and just like passable normal filing, I guess. With the gaps filled, the next thing to address is how uniform and kind of non-orky everything is looking. Time to break out some panels and add on extra paneling. I have recently been using a ton of printer plastic just because it's thick, easy to work with, and free. Start out by sawing or slicing a line, then using pliers or vice grips, I just grab it and give it heck. Snap that strip off and then break it up into smaller chunks and weather the edges. For this, I like to use a small triangular file. A rasp is also a good way to quickly rough up the edges. Just look out for the fingers! Ah! I also like to bend and warp some panels. This is very easy with the printer plastic and it doesn't spring back after it's bent. I also slice in some weathering with a hobby knife, or use the pliers to pinch and damage up the quote-unquote metal. With a hefty inventory of panels at hand, I can jump right into this paneling montage. Panel, 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 panel. Ooh, oopsie, looks like somebody made the jaw too big. I take a quick break from paneling to edit the neck, and then I panel, 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 hole punch, hole punch, panel, panel. It's not really a panel, but the feet still need a second claw. I scan my remaining plastic and find this piece. It's pre-curved and has this interesting step-down detail. Slice and then easily snap away. Very low effort. Th there we go. Trim that down and punch in some rivets. That there is a nice looking toe. I clip out and then shape up some little spikies now that the outer toe is getting jealous. I like panels to sit flush with the surface, but in cases where they aren't, I use a little bit of modeling paste to fill it in. I like the panels to feel very securely attached. Neck hole mount goes in now. Does the head look passable in there? Sure. Work armor needs to have a jaw too. A metal jaw, full of metal teeth. After cutting out the shape of the big boy main attraction teeth and giving them a bit of a curve, I realized that oh, they're going to kind of suck for this scale unless they're fat. Operation Teeth Fatification begins with layers of cardstock stacked and glued and clamped on the back. Once that's dry, I satisfyingly clip it away and paste up the edges. Finally, the whole shebang gets sliced and weathered like any other panel. I'm also slightly damaging the surface with shallow drilling to simulate bullet holes. Once the other teeth have the same weathering treatment, they get glued into place, and then the remaining chin jaw area gets filled in with other fragments of interesting plastic. If we're going to be protecting the jaw, then you better believe that this behemoth is getting some arm protection. To get the general shape of the shoulder armor, I split this thing, which might have been like a speaker, I don't know. Hey, cool bit, save that for later. I cut down this defunct Tupperware lid to add a thick edge to the shoulder plates. Then I punch in some more hole punch rivets. Once in place, some mega blocks and a bit more printer paneling is added to bulk out the top and cap out the inner face. Take those shoulders to detail town with this year's hottest fashion, teeth and squares. Hey, what the heck? These legs have a distinct lack of rivet. I place down these custom milliput rivets, lay down that glue line, and then push them into place. Sometimes I use these mini nut and bolt style rivets as well. 
Give those a gentle pat. Good boy. Now I take the skills I developed riveting the legs and apply rivets everywhere else. The industrial district we're calling the power plant, the stylish shoulder details, and the Omega Flex Mega Jawline. Look at this good variety of rivet styles. You might be saying, oh, this isn't for 28 millimeter scale. This is more like an action figure. Get this off my tabletop and get out of my house. And you're right. I might need something to sell the scale. Is, uh, is this what you're looking for? This meeting never happened. I shoved this mini skull into place between the teeth. Part trophy, part fuel for their condescending dentist's lecture on flossing. Speaking of foot and mouth doctors, here is a foot. I wanted to seal off this open toe mega croc, so I added some popsicle sticks and this hexagonal metal rod. This was also a good chance to weather up the feet with a bit more filing. Hmm, how about even more weathering? This is something I've seen Lincoln Wright do. Uncle Night Shift uses a more refined version of this as well. Squirt out some Tamiya putty from Japan and whoa, whoa, that has a strong smell. Good thing I'm in a fully sealed up room so no one else has to smell this. Huh? Get that putty on your gloved finger and smush and smear it all over. It cures really quickly, so go fast. This ends up giving a really awesome and solid surface texture. It also stinks and strips paint, so maybe add this in the pre-pre spackle priming stage. I also add some to the teeth for good measure. I really love the heavy cast metal texture that it gives. What's that? You think some of the DACA detailing is underwhelming? Me too. The plasma cannon already uses part of a lighter, how about using part of the thumb rolly part as a super detailed barrel? Nice ridges. And maybe these lower detail connects rings for the turbo laser? Great job, team. I need tubes. These are 100% Lego. I cannot deny it. Garden wire 2. Finally, enough detail. Now the whole lot needs to be encased in armor. Just let me scan the code. Uh, this will do. I free the nifty plastic shape from its printer shell prison and slap it on. Then I save its sibling too. Bam! I need to slightly edit the arm to accommodate it, but that was the plan all along. I continue adding plastic chunks, some of which are mega blocks. Most are weathered beforehand. It is so much filing. Eventually I get to slide in the final puzzle pieces and the casing is done. Teeth? Sure, why not? More panels even though I said I was done? Sure, why not? Rivets? Obviously. As big as this mighty gun show gun arm is, it needs a bit of mech based assistance. I build a nice, supportive best friend type of mech arm. There is definitely beams and round parts and pistons. If you can identify these parts, please leave me a comment. I need help. Once the underlying structure is done, it won't hurt to add a few armor panels, right? Remember when I said I would use these ammo belts last? I lied. Or did I? Affix the Jenga socket cube. Now the axe needs that detail pass. If you were hoping there would be a big tube, you are in luck. Armoring up with a few big printer panels that are pre-riveted with the hole punch. But I don't stop there. I am an uncontrollable juggernaut of panel application. In my berserker rage, I inadvertently blocked up the exhaust ports on my definitely real rhino hull. Let us re-add exhaust options using these car model kit exhaust pipes. This would 100% break on the first chop, but it also gets serious style points. For some backup venting, I drill some holes into this panel. I start with a small pilot hole, then I use a large bit to make a shallow rounded opening, and then an in-between size drill bit straight through. This prevents any weird shard or flakes popping up around the edge and makes a much cleaner finish. I think the arm might also break if it doesn't get some mechanical help. Again, I affix various electronics plastics to form an exosuit type assisted arm. I think this part is from a Nintendo Wii. Nothing is spared. After a test fit, I attach a few armor panels and this sweet armor donut for the elbow joint. And yeah, look, it's built. Good. What do you want me to say about my painting skill? Think about that while you watch me paint. Spray paint. Zenithal Prime, which is a thing that people with two different spray paints like to do and talk about. It's nothing special. I'm going to make my own paint using several paints. Ponder this tiny orb as I toss it into the jar with many silver paints. Once it has been shaken, I paint it onto the entire thing using a paintbrush. Unsurprisingly, this mostly mech-based model will be mostly painted like metal. Get it good and silvery, but then it's kinda too silvery. 
a wash or glaze of a thin dark color will add some contrast. Surprise, I also make my own glazes. Add some colors to water and then a healthy dose of the actual store-bought products that are produced by the channel, SB Varnish and SB Medium. Get lots of medium out there, just like milk in a cow. Ah, too messy. Old school Matt, please protect us. There, already proving its worth, but don't waste that brown paint. Shaky shaky and then shake and then glaze time. The glaze flows into all the recesses but also makes everything kind of sad and dull. So I do a quick dry brush of metallic on the edges. Continuing the highly successful trend of making my own paint, I assemble the perfect orc red. Official paint mixture being complete, I take a random terrible brush and start to add red paint to the middle of each panel. I have just discovered that if you avoid painting the edge, you can leave the exposed metal as free weathering and chipping. Neat, right? For a bit of variation, I mix in some yellow and orange as I go. Part of selling the aged or previously red painted armor is to apply at least some red to as many places as possible. Even if most of it has been worn away by the sands of time and battle, there should be a little remaining and very few panels should be plain silver. Once that red layer is dry, I want to add some variation or modulation. I, I don't know the technical term, but I promise it'll look cool. I make a brown black glaze and apply it to every red panel, brushing it so it flows to the bottom edge. Might look crazy and messy or dirty, but boy oh boy. Ooh, look at that. Now it's just a matter of accentuating certain red elements at the top of each panel. You get a pretty nice range of tones for just one solid layer and one glaze. Here's the part I look least forward to since I have no idea how to paint orc skin. I just make vehicles. But I knew it had to be green, so let's start there. By starting with maroon. I build up a base low light layer using a contrasting maroon brown color. I don't know where I saw it, but this is a common technique for orc skin. I block in the rest of the green with a happy dark Christmas green. With the base layer down, I start to use this lighter, slimier looking green to begin bringing up some lighter high points. Bro. I continue building up the lighter tones with the light green and white ink to lighten it further. As I work on that, I even do some primitive blending with various mid-tones. There was a bit of trial and error and back and forth, but eventually it came together. A final glaze of green to help unify the whole thing and then it was onto the face. There's a few unique elements such as around the teeth and lips. Here I used a series of hashes or short strokes to build a bit of texture into the highlight. I use the same color to highlight the eyebrows and forehead. Tooth and claw alike are brushed with a dank brown glaze for the lowlights, and finally an off-white cream tone for the main color. Orc lore indicates red eyes, but with a little glow action they always seem to come out orange. I worked back and forth with a few oranges and yellows to get this slightly glowy eye look. A final red glaze brings it home. Hey, not bad for a first try. Armor need black. This is paint mixed with black ink to make it super dark. I call it Black 10.0. Add it to the panels in the same manner as the red, avoiding the edges. Also in that manner, the white is added to various panels, details, and teeth. I know it's a little stark, but I'm coming back to it. Keep your shirt on. With the white going, it's a good time to block in some checkers too. We all know white is bad, so let's tone it up with some rusty tones. First, I flip it over and add an orange glaze, letting it flow down which will eventually be up. This ends up giving the look of rust seeping through the paint job. With that fully dry, upright it goes and I brush on a chocolate rain brown glaze, letting it flow down, which is down. It's generally a good idea to freehand some caution stripes. Here I go. Yeah, passable. This looted, definitely real model kit tank has just a hint of its former paint job. While I've got the blue out, I also paint a few cables since this is one of my tertiary colors. And so is this non-skin green. So let's get the cables with that too. Some of this sad lumpy metal needs a hint of gold. A bit of bronze or gold dry brushed onto silver is a nice way to break up some of that mechanical monotony. Literal, monotone, like one color. That's monotony. You should subscribe. Skull? <sighs> Cheers to more glazing. It's really hard to overweather a monstrosity like this, so I just keep going until I stop. I use a thick and chunky mix to dirty up the tail end of the business end of this chain axe choppa. This orc tech needs a glow up. Using various dark blue tones, I brush in a bit of an energy lighting effect. Then work up through lighter blues and finally a glowing white glaze for the hottest hot zones. I 
think I'm done with this thing. A very special thanks to all my patrons. Your support has kept me going through the long, hard decades I spent on this very large and special boy. Thank you. It means the world to me. If you would like to contribute to the quality and frequency of videos, or the general well-being of the channel, please consider supporting the channel on Patreon. Every tier grants you early access and sneak peeks of future content, as well as bonus in-depth showcase and breakdown videos where I delve into my approach and build methods for every project. You also get lifetime Discord access and a credit in every video. If you are unable to support the channel through Patreon but still want to help, you can always restart this video and leave it running at 0.25 times speed. Is that too cheeky? Well, how about this statement? <clears throat> this is the greatest custom orc model that has ever been posted to the platform. Eh, not bad, right? Of course, if you hated it, you can always try to press the dislike button. Oh, oh no, it's been hidden. Go ahead and leave a comment with a timestamp to the exact moment that you are critical of. Give me your best shot. Maybe I'll respond and we can argue a bit. Who knows? Shout out to my Orktober boys, Narb and Wylock. Please consult the description for links to their channels and every other channel featured in the video. Okay, subscribe and share this with literally everyone you know, and I will see you in the next epic build video.